Canadian twins Dean and Dan Caton are the dynamic duo behind Italian fashion label D Squared, which celebrates its 20th anniversary this week. In order to pursue their fashion dreams, Dean and Dan ventured far from the suburbs of their native Toronto, eventually moving to Milan where they set up D Squared. Today, the brand turns over more than 200 million euros and has expanded to include men's, women's, accessories, children's, eyewear and fragrance businesses, and even a restaurant. D Squared is now set for a rapid global retail expansion, online and off. In an exclusive interview at their home in London's Notting Hill just days before a retrospective fashion show, the business of fashion goes inside D Squared to learn about Dean and Dan's ups and downs over the last 20 years, the lessons they have learned, and their plans for the future. Hi guys. Hey. It's a pleasure to sit down with you today uh, to talk about your fashion adventure. How does it feel to be here marking your 20th anniversary? That's a really big number. Uh, I really consider myself very fortunate to have hung around for 20 years. When, you know, so many people that started at the same time as us you know, aren't around anymore. And it's a tough business. Nobody's welcoming anybody. Uh, so I guess we're good at kicking and screaming, scratching. We're proud. We're proud that we've done what we wanted to do. Uh, we've arrived to a certain point in our careers and um, things are actually just kind of falling into place right now. But things at the beginning, they weren't always easy, right? You know, you've spoken in the past about having grown up in Toronto and, you know, feeling a little bit out of place. Um, how has that whole experience in your earliest years back in Toronto in Willowdale, which is a suburb mm -hmm. of Toronto, how, how, how did that experience shape you? Well, I think, you know, growing up a little um, challenged, um, challenged with money, challenged with, with fashion for sure, um, made us want things more, you know. I mean, we wanted, to, we wanted fashion that we couldn't obtain. We wanted success that was not in, in our neighborhood. It, it um, gives you more ambition. It gives you fire and... And I think, you know, um, maybe not having is the reason we work harder to have. And uh, it's, uh, it's definitely... Um, a good push. It also gives you appreciation too, you know, if you don't have something, you, you appreciate it more, you work hard for it, you appreciate it more, and it's more um, fulfilling. Right, so looking back at your story this past few days as I've been researching Dean and Dan, it seems to me like your first big break came after you left Parsons. You went to this summer school program mm -hmm. and you, you moved back to Toronto and you started designing for Ports International, which you know, a lot of people don't know that brand, but it, you know, growing up in Canada, that was something mm -hmm. that everybody saw in all the shopping malls everywhere. You know, as, as a designer or as designers starting out, I often tell my own students, well, you, know, you should go design for somebody else Absolutely. first. What did you learn from that experience at Ports? Well, I think, yeah, I think you said it best. I mean, it's always, it's always, always better to work for someone else and to, you know, exactly. to learn. I mean, to learn you can, and then my boss used to say, make, make your mistakes on my money. Because when you're ready, <laughs> you, you've already made the mistakes that you, that was silly mistakes. that six years of every day, real situation training from factories in Hong Kong. Uh, just every, it was to, to selling the, the collection. He made us do it. He was amazing, Mr. Luke Tanabe. He saw us, he saw our taste level, he said, and everyone said, you're, you're crazy. They're 19 years old, they have no school. And he said, those two boys have taste, and there's no school in the world that can teach anybody that. And so he took a big risk with you know, hiring us. And the first day when he hired us, he said, you know what? If you come bring me coffee in the morning, that's a help. If you turn, turn the company up upside down, that's a bigger help. help. Do what you can do. And then in six months, we were in Hong Flying Kong. First class to Hong Kong. Fitting the whole first collection. And, and we did like a flip on the collection. And, it, and all of a sudden, then people started noticing the brand more. I mean, sales and then went up 25%. Sales went up. We started getting covers and stuff. And, and the, like, all of a sudden, the brand kind of had a new face. And then people were curious about why the brand had a new face. And then, then some stuff started coming out about us and stuff. And then actually, we kind of became a little bit almost famous in our own small little realm of, of, of Canada. And um, it kind of shocked us. We said, you know what? That wasn't that difficult. 
And so maybe there's a formula here, you know, something that we've done here. Let's just try to take our same will and our same well, formula and put it, on a, key, put it on a bigger scale. It was also a key point when you sold the company. It was our cue. We've done six years. People do four years in a school. We've been six years of on, hands-on training. And uh, we didn't really feel like we're, we, come, we don't come with the company. And it was our clue to move on and to go to Europe and to follow our dreams. So you moved to Milan you know, far away from Toronto. And I understand to make ends meet, at first you did some go-go dancing at night. Well, let's call it go-go dancing. <laughs> Imagine it. <laughs> so it what was that? So you, what, what was it like? To come to well, it, 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 started, it started off as like a, a PR kind of thing to promote clubs and have some, you know, people come. We were into fashion, we were into designing, we were into costumes. So then, you know, we would sometimes, we make costumes, like club costumes and outfits and to be more interesting and to be like image inside a club. And so it was... So they would pay us to come and look fabulous and the club. people would want to come and see us being fabulous. And was that, was that the kind of original DNA of the D-squared brand in a way? Well, not really. I think it comes with creativity and I think it comes with us um, in a, a whole love for theatre and theatrics and, and drama and, and those kinds of things that we find in our shows and find in our collection. And at the same time, it was a creative release because we were making all the costumes by ourselves. Uh, we're sewing them. It was something to ready. do. Um, it's the, one of the funnest times of our lives. And then at some point, you sat back, the two of you, yeah. and you said, okay, now's the time. <laughs> it was 30. Yeah, we reached our 30th birthday and we said, oh my God, what are we doing? We were designing for our big company when we were 19. Now we're 30 and we're working in clubs and we're looking at some of our other peers and said, I don't want to be that person in five years. So let's get back on track and you know, get to doing what we really came to do. And uh, we just said, how much money do we have saved? And let's put it all together and let's just go for it. What was it like? Do you go back to that first show 20 years ago. What, what was that show like? What was that moment well, like? Well, it was our homesick um, I mean, collection. It, it was, it all, all the guys came out of sort of the forest, these green trees, and long underwear, and opera music. And, Big check plaids and big Canadian looking sweaters and stuff. It was very a very tribute of who we are. You know, I think I think um, what we tried to do also is to really attach ourselves to our Canadian roots and to you know what we are makes and what makes us different in that industry. And uh, we kind of tapped into that and we kind of ran with it. I, mean, I think the thing that was really quite simple about that it was a very tiny collection. It was a little capsule. It was thirty pieces. So any store, any store could you know take a small order and it would make a nice package. You know, it was it was complete and it was packaged. It was really so, edited. Yeah. So you know you had this one, one, one little one stand and it was one nylon. One card and one complete. Right. So it wasn't a big risk for people to buy it. And things were cute. Mm -hmm. the, the thing is, though, when, when designers go off and, and sell their first collection, you know, they often think that's, that's where it ends. But actually, that's where it starts. Oh, yeah. Right, so you sell it, then you have to go and get it all produced and delivered on time. Mm -hmm. How did you cope with that in the first? That season? was a that bit of a drama for us because that that was the production. They they had agreed to doing it for us, but the only problem is we needed to do the next season, and we didn't have any money yet because we okay. spent it all in the first season. Cash flow. Yeah, so there was not enough time spread to get their money from what we sold. And so we kind of pleaded with, with the factory and we said, listen, we, we got a partner to help us financially. And he uh, had got us a loan to the bank. And uh, then we had enough money to carry us through the next season. And then we kind of, after the third season, we said to the factory that was producing us, come on, guys, we're paying for the patterns, we're paying for the samples. We're and you guys are just making all the money. So we need to start balancing it out. And now you guys should be taking care of the samples. You guys should make it. Obviously, it's working. We're selling. We've paid you in advance for the last three seasons. And now our things have to change. Oh, we're going to move on. Okay. And that's kind of what happened. Another thing I wanted to touch upon, you know, I was, I was going back through the history of your brand. And one of the things that comes up, of course, is music and, and, and celebrity. Going back, way back to 2000 and, mm -hmm. and Madonna. But then, in very rapid succession, you know, Christina Aguilera, Justin Timberlake, Rihanna. There's a lot of discussion in the world about the role of celebrities. But, you know, your brand seems particularly interesting one to examine because I think, at least from my observation, without celebrity, the profile, you know, for a small business, you know, based in Milan that was, you know, at the very early stages of development, it really helped 
to break you guys out into the into the global mainstream. Definitely. I mean, I definitely think, um, and even starting with Madonna, I mean, she was the first celebrity that we really worked with. And, uh, and then just the idea about her acknowledging, you know, and kind of showing to the world, oh, oh, this, is a, this is a cool new brand. She loves to be first. Yeah. And she comes with that stamp of approval. If Madonna thinks you're cool, the whole world wakes up. And thinks you, you know, or starts to look, you know. And so, in fact, after the first relationship we did after the first video and stuff and uh, it was a don't uh, don't tell me yeah don't tell me video and, uh, and proceeded to the drowning world tour. tour which was the whole cowboy segment of the tour with 15 dancers everyone in different outfit um, it was great it was a great learning experience and I think the thing too that was also funny about her is I mean the things that she was liking were the things from a men's collection and we didn't do women's yet and so they said okay we'll make them for her and then we added a few things number one t-shirt so that were like men's things um, adapted for a woman and then after she started wearing things it was just a season and a half later two seasons that we, we, we came out with women's yeah because there was a, a because there people say, oh, I want that, I want that. And, and did it happen the same way with all the other celebrities? I think the same person, that, the creative director that we were working with, that introduced us to Madonna was the same one that introduced us to Christina. It was Jamie King, and then uh, he was doing tours with them. And then they had asked us, "Would you do the opening of this?" And then we'd worked on the tour, and then we said, "Okay, would you come and do our show?" And it was kind of like a give and well, take. Yeah, and even it, you know, they were sweet and nice. We kind of created a friendship. I mean, with Rihanna, and then we had used her one song in the men's show. So we said, "Oh, you know, we should just call her." Have her come and open the girls' show with "Shut Up and Drive." Because it was a garage car setting. Breaks and down. And she's in a glamorous dress, and she pulls into the gas station, does the number, um, and it, it was. It was great for us. I mean, strangely, she yeah. said, "You know, on my day off is this." I said, "Okay, we'll change the date of the show," and she came over. We brought her over, and she did it, and she got and her back the on the same plane. Day she opened our store as well. Yeah. The first their store okay. in Milan. She cut the ribbon together with us. And then got back on the plane, went straight up on stage mm -hmm. to do a concert. In Canada, actually. <laughs> I mean, we really, really appreciate the energy and the support that we've, we've gotten from the celebrities that we've worked with. I think we try to build a nice relationship. I think we're, I think we're just very sincere people and we're very honest and straightforward. Yeah, Christiane Aguilera is one day before us birthday. You know, so she's Sagittarius too. We had a birthday party together. Mm -hmm. It's fun. I mean, it, it, and it, they're, they're great for the brand. It's really helpful for us. I mean, people love to see what celebrities are wearing, what celebrities are doing, and um, it's definitely a huge boost. The other people that really got behind you were the models. Can you talk a little bit yep. about how yep. that all happened? Well, I think it happened because before, okay, this was also an intelligent move that we have done. Um, before we came out with a full women's collection, we said, let's, let's, because if we come up with a collection and we have to tell oh, the buyers, okay, oh, we'll try it a little bit now. And then we have a budget and then we've wasted our energy. So, so they can have a taste and they can buy it and they like can. Like it, don't like it, prepare Working, not working. Season. When we will be a full collection. So in those nine, those nine pieces, we wanted to shoot them in the campaign. So we were shooting Naomi. We in the, with Stephen Klein, and Stephen Klein, why didn't you use Naomi? We're like, well, we amazing. Have to use Naomi, right? So yeah. we used her for the campaign. We're shooting with her. We get, get along perfectly. It's a great shoot, wonderful. And they said, "Listen, babe, we're gonna do uh, a very full first woman's show." Uh, next we'd would, would, to, open to open it for us. And she's like, yeah, I'm down, I'm down. And then so she said yes, and then she had signed uh, something with the agent that she would do the show. And then they, the agent showed the other agents, and because she was willing to do it for, for a young designer budget, uh, uh, she got all the other girls to kind of fall in, and then everybody said, oh, this is the show to do. And, in the land, the and we, you know, off, and we had this casting of over 750 thousand euros which naturally we didn't have that money at the time and uh, so you know it, girls were coming in coming in, coming in, coming in. we had the number oh, you don't want me I don't, honey, I can't afford you I'm come over give me a pair of jeans I'm coming by who said that Carolina Kokova wow she was the last one to fall in I know it was it was it was great I mean it was probably a moment for us that it was like Super, it was really like a, yeah. Hard to but you know what was really cute about that too I mean the thing that was cool and I think maybe the girls feel cool we said you know come in Pick your outfit. We had all the outfits on the wall. You know, what, 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 you, what would you, you like? You know, right. and then and then it was it was kind of cute because yeah. they and were loving yeah. they were loving the collection. They were loving the pieces, and that also made us we feel like really it. positive yeah. about okay. You know, this is they would be our ideal target person. And it kind of just was worked out into this amazing energy of 
oh, positivity and fun. Also, because the, the theme was 24-7 star, they came out of a plane and we had fans rush in underneath the plane with cameras screaming. So when Ayana comes out, they're all screaming her, for her name. name, taking pictures from there. And she's like, you need to have fans at every show. They give you such a big energy and instead of a boring front row that doesn't even clap. Right. And then it was, it was kind of like a walk off. It was funny because every girl was trying to outdo the other girl. And so it was like, there's a lot of energy. It was probably, probably one of the most memorable shows. Ever. For that reason. Sounds amazing. The rest is kind of history, so let's fast forward to today. Uh, okay. You know, like you launch Women's Wear, you do the partnership with uh, Renzo Rosso and Staff mm -hmm. International. How, how does it all work now today? I mean, I think a lot of people are curious about the division of labor between the two. I mean, just the way the two of you are, you kind of complete each other's sentences, you, you know, you're, you're we're, twins. We're, how, how, give us an idea of how it actually works. We're a package deal. So um, I think we are super in sync. So we kind of have an eye, if not completely together on one, everything, there's, we'll bounce back on certain things that maybe, yeah. because it's getting so much the workload that, you know, maybe he has to focus on writing on to go. I think the, on. from the beginning, we, in the beginning, we were both doing things together, everything in together. But and I think now, because we have more ground to cover, like maybe he'll There's be doing a woman's fitting, I'll be doing a men's fitting at the same time. The same time. And then yeah. at the end of the day, we just, you know, make notes. Like, okay, this yeah. is what happened we here. We had to one collection to do back in the day. Now we have like almost 15. That's all the creative side of things though. But mm -hmm. what about the business side? Is there one of yeah. you that kind of takes the lead? He's on a little bit more patient with uh, that, those kind of... I, I try to stay on, on top of the business maybe more than, just because I think also sometimes the business side, Sometimes it's a little bit annoying, and sometimes it's a little bit, um, um, I wouldn't say, it just, just it kind of makes they you lose talk. your interest in, in the creativity part. So I think to not like to really dampen and damage your creativity, I think I can absorb things and take things in a certain way and then and express them in another way. That I mean, sometimes meetings, they're just like, oh, and I, I'm forever. over it. And they talk forever to say one little Stupid. thing, and I know he has, zero patients and it won't get through one of those meetings but i think you can tell me in 15 minutes what it took them three hours to talk pretty much right well it's nice that one of you can can drive the <laughs> conversation <laughs> and get it done responsible one of, the, the <laughs> so. um, of course it's not just the two of you right you you alluded earlier to kind of being control freaks but mm -hmm. you know i think one of the things that fashion designers aren't, aren't often known for is is their leadership but Fashion designers, you know, you have you know hundreds of people working with you. You have teams of people all over the world. You, know, how do you, how would you describe your kind of management style or leadership style? How is it that you motivate all these people? The the thing that's different about our company is, I mean, because we're a family, it's kind of based on a family kind of um, situation. I mean, I think we treat our employees like family. Um, the people that have been with us are senior people that have been with us, some of them from the very beginning. Um, and I think making people involved and keeping people part of it, and making them working as a team, it's, I think it's, we have a nice energy between our staff. It's not like a, a, a employee uh, in employer relationship. I think we're like a one big family, and I think we always say that with the Discord family. Some of them have been with us for a long time, and some of them have just joined us. But we I try to make everyone feel welcome and feel like a family. Right. And we're just the papas. That have the work. old, the old guys the at the top of the hill. Teach our kids, you know, <laughs> the right way. Well, that kind of brings me to my next question, which is, you know, when I when I think of D squared, when you know growing up in Canada myself and first hearing about you guys. I think of like denim and like wacky slogans and you know, really um, kind of in your face, right? And today, you know, you're transformed into these elegant, you know, tailored, you know, it looks like Napoli style tailoring, you know, with nice soft shoulders. And tell us about how the brand has changed over the years because it's it feels yeah. like it's grown up Matured. a bit um, well I definitely think the evolution comes with time I mean when we started the company we were young we were in a kind of different kind of head headspace and we were things that we were doing I mean the company really reflects us and our lives so I mean at that point in our time we were still going to clubs we were still going out we were still partying and, and we were in another kind of mood I think as we mature and things the party start changing into dinner and the dinners start changing into events and, and charity things. Um, the, the, the wardrobe starts changing with it. And um, 
our expectations start changing. Um, so I think always keeping ourselves in mind and tailoring to our own needs, um, the brand is kind of just matured as we matured in age. And we still love the t-shirts and we love denim, uh, but we, you know, we're just broadening the, 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 public. the public. It's actually to see that trans transition in the, over the 20 years. So I mean, even in, um, we do the music for the shows and it's something that we really get involved in and exciting. So we kind of want to do this sort of like retrospect from the collections and from the evolution of the mud jeans and the t-shirt and the fringe into the you know the Canada part and into the the dark part and into the tailored part and and as as it you know but you see a common denominator that's taking you still from that same denim muddy guy to to the smart tailored guy at the end of the show so that kind of brings me to my next question which is you know you've talked about this transformation of the brand over the years and adding all of these different collections and you know now you have as you say ready to wear eyewear fragrance underwear kids a large proportion of your business uh, is done through licensing partnerships mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's the shoes the bags and the accessories that are done in-house mm -hmm. yeah. that's quite an interesting strategic decision to make in terms of how you work. Can you explain why you've decided to do some things in-house and um, some things external? Yeah, I mean at the first, in the beginning everything was one master license, it was all in-house with, with staff. Except and for shoes. Except for the shoes, yes you're right. And then um, then we did another shoe license, we did a shoe license with Vicini. I think from the very beginning when we did the ready to wear with our, this small factory that we were involved with, uh, they didn't have the know-how to produce shoes. So we went apart and we saw the get the pros and cons of not everything being under the same umbrella. Um, you know, it worked, it worked for us. So then as we moved on, I can go in, we, did, we could pick which, you know, what they need. It's like a pizzeria or a restaurant. You do one thing, you do it great, or it would be the pizzeria. And a restaurant, you have to do a lot of things great and it's a lot harder. To find, so we prefer to in the cases where you know the perfume people that have to be outside lines because they know the perfume. The shoe people have to be outside because it's completely different. It gives you and more variety. I mean, if you have to keep everything in, into one licensee, then uh, you're dealing with their their people. So now by taking it in house, we can choose from whoever we want. You know, I have one great factory that makes jeweled women's shoes, and he just makes those. I have another factory that makes sneakers, I have another factory, and, and we can spread it all out. Normally when you have a licensee with one factory, you have to stay everything inside. And some so, things are not good at doing. So Back you're limited. And restaurant. Right. So over the years, you know, the business initially grew by adding different collections. So it started with menswear, and then you added women's wear and all of the other collections. My understanding is now the real big focus of growth is coming from retail expansion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, retail, retail, retail. I mean, this past year, or in 2014, you were opening something like more than 15 stores. Mm -hmm. um, and now, uh, next in, in 2015, um, there's, there's even more retail expansion planned. How, how does this change the way you think about the business? Well, I think the whole the whole push with retail comes from um, image of uh, the image of the brand and how, how people perceive who we are. I mean, as you just said, um, as the brand has matured and has it's changed and over the fast. years, um, it's it's our responsibility also to put the message out the way we want it to be understood. Because some people have a misinterpretation of who we are and what the brand is. So by doing our own retail stores, we can communicate exactly the message that we want to communicate. We have the look of our stores, we have the trained people that understand the, the brand, and understand the, what the, about. the product. Um, it just, it's just an it's easier face. It's experience for our customer. They come in and everything, you know, they know, they get a glass of champagne, they're comforted, and they're in the surrounding, they feel that, you know? And also, everything's in one place, from the kids to the backs of the shoes, to the knitwear, to the bathing suits, to the underwear, perfume, eyewear. So, you know, it's if the you whole can't, lifestyle. Yeah, it's a lifestyle. So if you can't, you know, maybe the clothes, are, you can't fit the clothes, you can fit the shoes, you can fit the perfume, you can fit the eyewear. If right, you, uh, so you can go from like the, the entry price points all the way to the top end price points. You can go from across every collection. Okay. <clears throat> but that means you also have to make decisions about where to open stores. Yes, definitely. So, you know, this past year, in 2014, you opened your first store in the States, in yeah. Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Can you talk me through the decision? I mean, I'm hitting the American market, okay. trying to okay. figure out like where to open, what to sell. Um, How did you guys do that? 
Okay, well, I mean, definitely Same this was the, this was this was the year for America. I mean, it's it's we're twenty years in business, and and we find that probably one of our weakest markets is the U.S. So um, except for except for online, yeah. so our online our online business, which is increasing massively day so by day. Ask yourself why? It's because they can't find anything in America. They have to go online. So. And most of the online shopping was done right up from LA. The highest percent of online shopping front was the US. Right. Second was from Los Angeles. So the three stores that we're definitely going to target for the first year was Los Angeles, I mean, New York, uh, Los Angeles, and Miami. And so um, we would have opened New York first, but due to timing and, and stuff, LA, LA was easier to open first. So that's interesting. You used data and intelligence from where people were shopping on the website mm -hmm. to figure out where the demand was yeah. in the market. A little bit, yeah. It's, it's almost simple in a weird way, you yeah. know. Who, where, 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 where? I mean, definitely because it, 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 there's a lack of us in America, so I think uh, pinpointing where we was. And, and that also helps, you know, um, for this department stores and long shops that they get, you know, it helps the visual people see exactly what we are, it helps uh, the, the brand awareness, it, just a good right. situation. The other market you've been trying to conquer is China. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, were, you opened uh, Shanghai Fashion Week back in mm -hmm. April. But I understand that that's been a really complicated market for a variety of different reasons. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about, you know, the US market is one major market that's challenging, but you know, the Chinese market's a whole different. Well, I think the Chinese market, there's just a huge potential that, you know, we feel like that we're not, not going. The challenge is different. It's so there's a few issues and the issues are being cleaned up and uh, um, we are opening stores. We're just not opening at the rate that we wanted to. So we're taking tender steps into the Chinese market. Um, good cities. I think there's already like eight stores now in China so far. Um, it's just we have to be really precise about where we where we go and who we go with. Let's let's look ahead a bit. I mean, you guys have had this. Look at all, you have these um, all these amazing stories. What, what what do you wish for in 2015? What, what, what do you hope this year kind of represents for you and your business? Mm. No, I don't know. Um, no, I mean, I think, I definitely, I think what we find about talking about even 20 years, I think, I think what we're really experiencing now is that, you know what, now, just now, 20 years later, we're ready. Now we're ready, we have built our foundation, we have built our company, we're financially set in certain ways, we have everything kind of lined up. Now we have the Next. machine, now we Next. need to start pumping her and making what her run. Make us happy in, for the future. Doing the restaurant was kind of a new Good thing start. for us. I mean, the whole lifestyle of a brand and of, 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 of us, and you know, I mean, we're looking into making, doing a spa and a gym and, um, who knows? Come along with Who knows? That. There's there's Furniture, lots of um, comes along with hotels. Just getting started. Yeah, yeah only I just begun. Yeah. One last question, which is, you know, for all those young people who might be in a summer a suburb similar to Willowdale, and they might be in Sydney, or they might be in you know in Sao Paulo, or they might mm -hmm. be in you know in Hong Kong. You know, what advice? Comes get, in one song, climb every mountain. Right? Yeah, That's I mean, theme. Energetic, positive. From the sound of music, <laughs> when little Maria was strayed. And what does that song mean to you? Well, it's, you have to don't look Just go down. for it. I mean, I, I think the thing is, um, you know, it's really not where Follow you... every rainbow until you find your dream. It's not where you come from, it's where you're going. So, I mean, we came from a little suburb and, you know, we're kind of, everything kind of was against us. It's like, you know, you're, how are you going to go from there to there? And my, our father was the first person to say that. And so we're like, you know what, we're just going to go there and we're going to shoot for there. And then if You'll we land, know. if we land over here, we at least we tried to go over there. Um, and I think the main thing with what my advice would be to young people that really want to do something is, is to stick with it. You know, I think sometimes Don't people give up too early, you know, I mean, Nothing comes or nothing. You, You've got to be prepared to have a lot of hard work. And I think you have to really, really, really want what you want to do. You can't just say, yeah, mm, I want to be a designer. Be, uh, you know, a movie star. Yeah. You know, like... It's, <laughs> it takes no, time. No, it takes it, 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 yeah. Really, it's something that's grown inside us ever since we were this big. Uh, we've always thought that you And I think we wanted it more than anything and else, and I think that's the key. Yeah. Yeah. Well. As a Canadian and someone who grew up watching you guys, I want to congratulate you. I think Thank it's you. it's a really exciting, happy moment for 
for you, but also for everyone who's grown up as your fans. And I wish that 2015 brings you even more good things. Thank you.